Well, I'm always excited as we get started on each new seminar on the gifts of the Spirit because I know that God is, is feeding the hungry. And those of you who are anxious each week to come and, and study with us, I know that uh, as you are eagerly waiting for each seminar, that's a sign that you're hungry for the Word of God, and that thrills my, my heart right down to the boots. So we are talking about the gift of tongues. We finished up the subject of what purpose it is in our personal life, and now we're on the subject of what purpose there is as far as in the assembly is concerned. In the church, what purpose and why do we speak with tongues in the church? So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we've been in 1 Corinthians 14 for a little while on this discussion, but this is where the Corinthians had been going off the ball a little bit, and so we have to find out what we can do to correct things today and see that our own assemblies do not get out of order. It tells us here in verses 27 and 28, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. And if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Now you see, last time we were talking about the fact that when unbelievers or unlearned came into the assembly and everybody was talking in tongues at once, that is out of order and in a state of confusion, okay? That it would turn them off. They'd say, look, you're nuts, you're crazy, you're out of your tree. But we don't want that to happen. We want to exercise this gift properly in the assembly so that people will be drawn to Christ. And so now it says here that if indeed there is someone who does speak in tongues, Let's assume something here, that if they did it on, the, on three attempts, let's say that um, you started to speak in tongues the first time. And the, of course, the proper time has come in the assembly so that you can do it. You're not going to start speaking in tongues when the pastor is giving his sermon. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so now you speak in tongues when the appropriate time is. Now, supposing there's silence, and then there is no one else, uh, give you the giving and interpretation of tongues, or no one else speaking in tongues, supposing you make a second attempt at speaking in tongues. And still there is no interpretation either by you or anybody else. Now, following this, of course, we're going to go into the study of the gift of the interpretation of tongues, but I can't do that right now. We can only just cover so much ground at one time. So, uh, supposing you make the third attempt at speaking in tongues and there is no interpretation, then the leader or someone or yourself, whatever the case is, should refrain from speaking in tongues in the assembly accepting that there is an interpretation, because no one's understanding it. Paul says, and I think it's in verse 5 in this same portion of Scripture, he says, I want you all to speak with tongues. All of you. I would that you all did it. Now, he's talking about it in their private prayer life, but he also says, but rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret. Except he interpret. So tongues with interpretation of tongues in the assembly equals prophecy. Now we're out to build up the church, of course. And so therefore, he is saying that, that while he wants us to speak in tongues, yet in the assembly we need in the interpretation of tongues. And there's a special reason for it. Tongues are supposed to draw the unbelievers to Christ, but by the same token, the interpretation thereof is supposed to build the believers. You're doing a twofold act of faith. I think that's neat. All right, so we've gone through one type of illustration. Now we go through another one. Supposing that there were three individuals that attempted to speak in tongues. Supposing that uh, this man here started to speak in tongues, and neither he interpreted nor anybody else brought the interpretation. Then you spoke in tongues, and then there was still a silence and no interpretation. Or maybe you began then to speak in tongues. Three attempts at speaking in tongues with no interpretation is the limit, the limit, the limit. That's it, that's it. Because there is no understanding of what's being spoken. No one understands it. And that's the purpose of it. We want understanding for the church now. All that's happening is that you're building yourself up in faith yourself and no one else is being built up. If I were to stand here for the, for the uh, rest of the time that we have a lot of this morning and, and speaking in tongues, you'd all have your television sets turned off and you people would get up and very quietly walk out. Maybe not so quietly either. <laughs> so, the reason is we want the, the people of God to be built up. Now, it does not say that there only has to be three messages in the church, and I'm going to cover this ground a lot more when we cover the interpretation of tongues and prophecy. It doesn't have to be a limit of only three messages. Some people only stop at one. 
It just means three messages in tongues without interpretation. You can have tongues, interpretation, tongues, interpretation, a prophecy, another tongue, another interpretation, another prophecy, another tongue, another interpretation, another prophecy, three more prophecies, another tongue, another tongue, another tongue, and interpretation of tongues. Are you following me? But not three in order where there is no interpretation. So I think if we get this established, that it's just a matter of so that there is no confusion and we are able then to bring the interpretation. We're going to show you that the person that speaks in tongues can also bring their own interpretation. Sure, you've got all nine gifts of the Spirit, so you're going to exercise all nine of them. That's neat. Now we want to look at verses 32 and 33 <clears throat> of chapter 14. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. <clears throat> now, I know that some of you are probably reading on down further, where it says, let your women keep silence in the churches. Now, I'm not going to go through that one right now. <laughs> you want to ask the question, ask me after we get through the teaching of the seminar, and we'll go into that one for you. But we're looking at this one that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And then also down to verse 39 and 40. Let, uh, wherefore, brethren, covet, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues, and let everything be done decently and in order. What do we mean decently and in order? What do you think the definition of decently and in order is? Well, I looked it up in the dictionary, and it means becoming proper, respectable, with honor, excellence, high esteem. That should be the words that denote the people of God. Oh, excellence, honor, high esteem. People that you can look at and say, hey, there is a servant of the most high God. Instead, we cower along. You know, I'm afraid somebody might even recognize us as a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say anything. <laughs> We're supposed to look dowdy miserable, cantankerous, hypocritical, you name it, that's what we're supposed to look like. Oh, no, we're not. You know that. <laughs> All right. Let's talk a little bit about this being decent and in order and uh, becoming and respectable. <clears throat> now, I've been in a number of places and I've seen a number of things in the course of the 25 years that I've been teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, I've come across a lot of things. Now, I know today maybe things aren't quite as bad as they might have been a few years ago. But uh, first of all, I think we ought to have, oh, let's get a volunteer. Would you, honey, come on, come on up here. Bring your chair, sit it right over here. I've got to have a volunteer here to help us out with this. Sit right down here, dear. Now, we have people, naturally, that have needs. There's a lot of people with needs in this old world. So when we have them come into the assembly and we bring them over to us, and we're going to lay on hands. And of course, everybody gathers around to lay on hands. Now I ask you, have you ever had 15 hands laying down on you? <laughs> have you ever had that? One hand here, another one hand on the head, and, and some back here, some are pushing this way, and some are pushing this way? Have you ever had, had that many hands? And I have, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, please, you know, lift up your hand, it's getting heavy. <laughs> when I was in Trinidad, a number of the core leaders got together and they said, uh, look, they wanted to minister to, to us because we were going to be ministering to them and they wanted the blessing of God. Well, there was about 10 or 15 of them there. I shared this with them after they laughed about this themselves. But um, uh, it, this is a country where it's quite warm, you know. And uh, I had just finished combing my hair in a nice, big, beautiful upsweep and one of these hair lift type things, a real nice, easy style, so that I could, uh, you know, look nice when I got up in the front of people to discuss these things. So they're all starting to pray. And one man comes up. He's a, a big, tall fellow, and he's a, got a great big hand. <laughs> and his hand is very sweaty, too, I might add. And he comes over, and he drops his hand right down on my head like this and flattens my lovely hairdo. <laughs> well, I had to die to self at about that point. I went out there looking like flat top. So look, I'm just throwing a couple of little items in here for free. Okay, this is just for free. You know, when you go to lay hands on people, first of all, you only need about two people, really, to lay on hands, don't you? Uh, the Bible says, if two agree is touching any one thing, it shall be done. So we don't have to have 15 or 20 people and everybody, you know, laying hands on them. I was in uh, 
uh, one of the meetings one time where um, we have to be reasonably careful, you know, what we do when we're laying on hands. Uh, sometimes we can very ignorantly step ourselves into something that maybe not be all so good. The reason that we lay on hands, first of all, the reason we lay on hands is just to indicate that this is the person that it's for. If I had hands laid on you, then that would be that I would indicate that I'm ministering to you. But I'm indicating now that I'm ministering to her, okay? So I have hands laid on her. Now, I would suggest, first of all, we don't really have to have hands laid on the tops of people's heads unless maybe they've got a flat hairdo or whatever. Uh, this gentleman who has a little bit uh, receding hairline, we could put our hand there. <laughs> but uh, let's be careful, okay? Because in one case, where we had uh, someone laying on hands, they had, a, they had a ring on their finger here, and it was down on the top of their head. And when they went to lift their head off... <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. You're a sweetheart. Well, we do have to be careful how we minister to people. Now, you know, we had a, we had a, a house where we were having some meetings. And um, th there were some people there that were really, uh, if I might say, getting just a little bit fanatical. I was saying in my heart, Lord, you know, you've been asked, you, I've been brought here in order to teach on these things for a special purpose of, uh, of showing that we, there is areas where we need help and correction in these things. But I didn't want to step on any people's corns. You know, I don't want to offend people. I want to help instead of hurt. And, uh, but here's what I was finding that uh, when they went to minister to one individual, everybody was uh, standing around and, and they would, uh, one person would pray in tongues and another person would yell out loud and, and everything and there was so much confusion. Now the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. I, I, I see something, you know, very realistic. I've been in the business world, I know what it's like. You get 12 men at a table and they're all gonna settle a problem. Now you've got Johnny, who is at the, who's the master of ceremonies. All right, Jim says, look, I've got a problem here. I want to voice my opinion. Well, supposing George doesn't like his opinion. So George pipes up and he says, no, I don't like that. And so what does the chairman do at that point? He says, you are what? Out of order. Sit down. Okay. We respect this sort of thing in the business. Why is it that sometimes in the church, we find a problem respecting this? when everybody's speaking it in at once, either in tongues or in English at once, and that individual cannot hear what is being spoken. There is no, no benefit from it at all. So I, uh, I didn't know how I was going to help this group of people. However, I just got started to speak. And uh, one of the precious little darlings over on my left was started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh my, you know, what's wrong? And so I said to her, honey, what's, what's the matter? Can we help some way? Well, she says, I, um, I came to the meeting and, and she says, I've got so many problems. I've got a, a problem with my husband at home and my children are sick. And oh, she says, I, I just feel so distressed and downhearted and everything. She says, I was just hoping to maybe get a word from the Lord today just to help me in some special way. And, so I said, well, Connie, come on, come on, come on over here. We'll just put the chair over here and you come and we'll minister to you. So she came over and sat in the chair. Now, immediately, about 10 or 15 people jumped up to come over to minister to her. We had about five of them with hands laid on her. We have several of them walking around the chair and they're saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Someone else is trying to prophesy, thus says the Lord. And they carry on, you know. And then we have these others standing behind them. They're all muttering away in tongues. And someone else is trying to out yell the next fellow, shouting hallelujah, praise the Lord. Well, finally, after they got through their little bit, then they, God bless you, dear. God bless you, you know, praise the Lord. Well, she went back to her seat again. I started in again, and here she starts crying again. And I said, honey, what's the matter? So she says, well, dear, she says, well, I, I came to have my need met. I thought maybe I'd hear a word from the Lord, but all I heard was somebody speaking in tongues in this ear and somebody shouting and somebody else praising the Lord and I couldn't get anything. She says, somebody was trying to give me a message and I couldn't even hear that. And I thought, oh boy, Lord, you sure know how to put a living example right in front of these people without me having to say anything. 
And so I had an opportunity to teach on it. Hmm? Now, I want to ask you one question. One question. Why is it, why is it now that when we have someone for ministry, and we have everybody's got their hands laid on them, why is it that everyone is standing around there speaking in tongues? Come on, why are you doing it? Why is everybody standing around there speaking in tongues? They don't know what else to do. That is correct. We're praying in tongues, hoping that maybe, like maybe, it's like putting a nickel in the slot in Las Vegas slot machines. <laughs> that if you, if you speak in tongues, something, something, something might happen. You know, it just might, you could get something out of this. But I think it, it's, you know, it's not that people don't want to know. I think they're, they're trying something, just anything. And I know that there is this old saying, but we have always done it this way. <laughs> You know, once a person starts to do it, once a group of people starts in to do this, they think that this is the normal. This is what Paul is saying. These Corinthians had gotten going on this so much of the time that he had to come in and say, hey, look, this, this, let, let everything be done decently and in order. They do it in business meetings out in the world. What's the matter with the church, huh? You, you have edified yourself at home in your closet, in your private prayer life. Now you're supposed to come to the church and edify the church. And God bless you. When you are standing there ministering to this person sitting in the chair or where they're standing in front of the church or even in their private home and you're ministering to them. And, and, and if everybody is talking in tongues at once, there is only one thing that's happening and that is the person being built up in their holy faith and poor Maggie Muggins sitting there in the chair needing ministry. There's nothing, nothing, nothing happening for her. Isn't that sweet? Now, the reason that we pray in the Spirit is to build ourselves up in our most holy faith so that now, when we come to lay hands on Maggie Muggins, huh? Hmm? now we're going into the battle. Huh? We're going to go in to meet her need or his need. There's a need, and now is the time for that need to be ministered to, not for you to continue to build yourself up in your most holy faith, but now to minister to them. And for lack of understanding in the other gifts of the Spirit, this is why there has been a failure. See? We don't know how to receive a word of knowledge. We don't know how to enter into receiving the discerning of spirits. We don't know how to enter into believing God for the miracle of healing that that person needs. So that's where we have a problem. We didn't pray in our closet at home in the spirit. So therefore, when we come, now we feel that maybe the atmosphere might help a little bit as we start to pray in the spirit. And everybody doing it once, and there's so much confusion in the ears of the person who's hearing, there's nobody, nobody, nobody's going to be edified. Nobody's going to be helped. I hope this will help us just a little bit, okay, as we start to minister to others. And you say, well, supposing, supposing that this sort of thing has been going on in our assembly, how can, I, how can I possibly change it, you know? Well, the only thing I can suggest is that as you're talking individually to people, maybe your priest or your pastor is easily to be approached. I don't know. Uh, you're going to have to use wisdom with it. I don't think we have to go to people and say, now look, this is what we're supposed to do and do it in a dogmatic way. I think love will conquer so many, many things. But let's not us be guilty of it then. Let's us learn to, uh, to enter in and do it properly. Now, there is the interpretation of tongues, though. Now, if indeed you are going to minister to someone and you speak in tongues, maybe there are some other unsafe people around you. So speaking in tongues is going to do what for them? Bring them to a knowledge of Christ. It's going to draw them as a sign. Now, you're also going to bring the interpretation, okay? So you can speak in tongues over that person, but please, please, please bring the interpretation. This interpretation is going to bless them and everybody else remain silent so that the word can be heard. Then, then if everybody wants to shout and praise God at once in chorus and in, in a worship and a sense of praise and glory and victory, then everybody do it at once. But let's do it so that it's not out of order, not indecent, and it's very, very becoming. Here's another factor. And I've had many individuals come to me for ministry on personal counseling basis. And I have some who are already filled with the Spirit. They know how to pray in tongues. And the minute they come under my hands and I put my hands on them, they start to talk away in tongues, jabbering away. And I say, now look, honey, come on, come on now. If you want to hear what God has for you, either in the word of knowledge or, or a prophetic utterance, there's no way that you can be speaking in tongues. All you're doing is concentrating on that. You won't hear then what God has for you. So just refrain, please, will you, honey? Just for now, okay? Just refrain from doing it. And as you do, then you will be able to hear what God has for you. 
So let's try to avoid every bit of confusion that we can, because certainly we want everything that God has for us. We don't want to, to be deprived of it. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 10, tells us here, and this is where some of the people have said to me, yes, but Mary, tongues is going to cease. Well, when will tongues cease? And it says that um, love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. All right, when is that which is perfect will come? If we look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, it says that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that's when uh, we will no longer need to speak in other languages. Because it says here, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, that it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then if you'll also note Psalms chapter 17 and verse 15, it says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Prophecy, our, not only prophecy, the gift of tongues and all of these gifts of the, of the Spirit are spiritual weapons for our spiritual age. When they cease is that given time when we go to glory, either uh, by natural death or when Jesus Christ comes back for the church at the rapture of the church, huh? At that time, that's when tongues is going to cease. That's right. And that's because now we won't need to speak in tongues. God doesn't need to speak in tongues. We are the ones that need to pray in the Spirit, huh? We're the ones, because we need to pray according to the will of God, and we have to overcome our infirmities and our weaknesses. So now, when are tongues going to cease? Certainly, not now, but as long as the church age lasts, that's as long as tongues is going to be. Then when we see him and we are like him and we become like him, that is when tongues is going to cease, because then we will no longer need them. We are going to see here now, and I'm going to give you a prophetic utterance of someone that brought one just before uh, the seminar began, and it's concerning these very things. I believe that when God gives a prophetic utterance, we need to share it so that others can also be benefited by it. But I would say unto thee, lift up thy hands, for surely am I not the deliverer that sets these people free? <clears throat> Did I not bring forth the captives out of Egypt? Did I not bring them through the Red Sea, that they would come forth to take the land that I have given unto them? So rise up in your spirits and be those that would wage a good warfare, to lift the oppression upon my people, to set them free and to bring them out into the land which I have given unto them. For it is the land of milk and honey given unto them, that they would take it and receive, that they would give unto many also. So come, come into that land, come take your rightful place, stand in the gap, be one to lift forth the shield, be one to wield the warfare, that they would come and be set free. Now the scriptures also teach us in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 12, it says here that we are supposed to be hot after spiritual gifts. Even so, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to that ye may excel to the edifying of the body. Zealous is hot after, hot after spiritual gifts. Let's get in there now, shall we? And enter into speaking in tongues at home and in the church.